warm welcome to the Art of Growth, the Symposium on Post Capitalist Imaginaries. My name is Jana Motu and I'm the Trader of Life programs here at Nothing New Contemporary. We hope all of you and your families are well and healthy on these complicated and precious times. For those of you who have been with us previously at Nothing New Contemporary, welcome back. And those joining us for the first time in the building, thank you for joining our community and this collective deliberation to think about what comes after growth. Today we will be presenting new proposals, ideas, research offerings that encourage mutually responsible sensitivity towards the environment. Our aim is to show how local action leads to, the leads to global impact, as we can no longer act globally without thinking locally, but also to consider how to move beyond the constant pursuit, to, uh, pursuit of economic growth as something necessary and natural, how to stay within the planetary limits and to change and transform the economy and the way we organize our lives. Among the questions we will be looking at over the course of today, we will discuss how cities can become more productive and effective spaces as a result of social relationships taking place in them. Social, political, economical, environmental practices are fundamental to social capacity in order to plan different agencies in the set of new transformations of urban spaces that we all live in. How can looking at the concepts of growth and alternative economies can be a tool to rethink attitudes and find possibilities of change, or at least invest in the process of unlearning from patterns and impulses and behaviors of our political, societal, and cultural structures and institutions, and how to deal with global connectivity and new planetary responsibilities, plus geopolitical, patriarchal, and colonial histories of power to make space for our different equity, non-dominant knowledge systems, and interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches. This event also kicks off our new year-long research trend and program titled Emergency and Emergence, which investigates transdisciplinary, sensorial, and speculative practices for reimagining the planet. Via questions of repair, pedagogy, remediation, and transformation, this program explores radical sense-making and questions how to move from emergency to emergence, from crisis to renewal. Reverberating with ideas and knowledges opposing racial and colonial capitalism, conceived through visual culture as well as political ecology and radical politics, Emergency and Emergence assembles diverse cultural practitioners, collectives and communities to generate new emancipatory possibilities and forms of life founded upon social justice and environmental well-being. The program will unfold over the course of 2022 and 2023 manifesting by way of study sessions, newly commissioned performances, the symposium that we're having today, and a series of workshops, as well as writer in residence and a new issue of uh, Contemporary Journal. Before I give the floor to my co-organizer, Theo, who is sitting in the front row, um, some very brief housekeeping notes. Uh, our live programs of talks, performances, and screenings seek to challenge, create challenging environments where open-mindedness and respect for each other's approaches and perspectives can foster growth. So please be mindful and respectful of each other's opinions and views. There are toilets uh, just outside the space to your right. You probably have discovered them already. In the unlikely case of emergency, uh, a member of staff uh, will guide you to the nearest fire exit. This event is being recorded, so please do use your microphones that will go around during the Q&A sections so that we can all hear you. We will also like to use this opportunity to extend our thanks to our funders today, the University of Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University, Birmingham City University, and the Leverhulme Trust for generously supporting today's event. I will also like to acknowledge the staff who are supporting us today, Jim, Shannon, Helen, Tom, Tom Chamberlain, and Tom Jones, uh, Craig, Nail, Andy, Catherine, and many others. Lastly, as with all events here at Nottingham Contemporary, today's talk is free to attend, but all donations are greatly appreciated to help support future free programs. So without further ado, I would like to bring uh, my co-organizer to the floor. Uh, the floor is yours, Dale. Thanks, Janan, and um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second day of the symposium, or um, and for those of you who tuned in yesterday and shunned the, the sunshine, the kind of warmest day of the year, um, welcome back. Uh, so my name's Theo reeves everson and I'm a research fellow at Birmingham School of Art. And it's, it's really great to be able to kick off the second day of the symposium with a few opening remarks. 
Um, yesterday, for those who tuned in, we had six incredible presentations that approach questions of planetary limits from the vantage point of political economy, political ecology, agroecology, decolonial thinking, sonic refusal, art and architecture. And today we've got an equally amazing uh, lineup of speakers for you and I'm, I'm personally feel it's a luxury to, to sit and listen to a lot of them. Uh, so before launching into the first of these panels, um, for those who weren't able to tune in yesterday, it's maybe worth dwelling briefly on what for many in the UK is still a, an unfamiliar concept, uh, the idea of degrowth, which uh, the title of the symposium alludes to. So to give you a highly abbreviated definition, degrowth is a, a planned shift in the metabolism of the economy, where the energy, materials, and waste, waste flows decrease while well-being increases. Speaking of degrowth at a time in which many are still reeling from the unplanned economic contractions caused by the pandemic is quite a difficult proposition, but I think one that is nevertheless still urgent in countries such as the UK um, that, in case we have forgotten, impose the ideology of growth on the rest of the world. So as degrowth and climate finance activist Tony Naushin uh, reminded us on the first panel yesterday, Degrowth of rich industrialized nations is another facet of decolonization. So it's, it's important that these conversations are happening here, even if uh, the fact that they are happening now is already impossibly belated. It's 50 years after the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth report published in 1972. And this was one of the first large scale publications to bring the issue of planetary boundaries to the table. Uh, and now the idea that growth can be, uh, quote unquote, decoupled from environmental impacts, transforming itself into green growth has become a popular fiction. In the few instances where decoupling has occurred, it's usually because industry has simply been exported to so-called developing countries um, through acts of environmental colonialism. So this symposium therefore encourages speculation on abandoning that specifically Western modern phenomenon of economic growth. It's easy to forget that economic growth wasn't even measured really before 1930, um, and considers the cultural consequences of this shift. Growth could be considered a, a quantification of the idea of progress. And yet an attempt to dethrone growth should not simply invert the binary or advocate a straightforward return to pre-growth cultures as the French political ecologist Serge Latouche has put it, we should be talking at the theoretical level of agrowth, in the sense we speak of atheism rather than degrowth. So stepping outside of the logical and temporal framework of economic growth entirely, rather than simply inverting the teleology of growth, is a process that takes place in an expanded field of cultural practices beyond economic science and technology. I think all too often, Imaginaries of the future are reduced to questions of technological development. And new technological developments, whether sources of renewable electricity, geoengineering, or nuclear fusion, are positioned as the answer, always just around the corner, to every planetary problem. Breaking with this techno-utopianism of green growth, many practices aligned with the shift towards post-capitalist thinking are nevertheless still highly speculative. They can also be rigorously practical. But rather than producing representations or blueprints of utopian visions, cultures of degrowth involve what Chris, Chris Carlson calls nowtopias that construct the future through everyday practices. And more than just uh, a missile word, which is how early proponents of, of degrowth imagined the term functioning in debates and protests, um, Degrowth intervenes in the routines of economic order and opens up spaces where logic, logics of extraction and limitless expansion start to unravel. These possibilities cascade through the way we think about land and labor, ecology and civic practices, fiction and finance, uh, which are just some of the topics we have lined up in today's talk. So in these, these panels, you'll hear from speakers who are passionate advocates for degrowth, um, speakers who are critical, um, or speakers who are ambivalent about questions of degrowth. 
As the diversity of online talks yesterday demonstrated, if you were able to tune in, the, the ambition of the symposium is not to impose homogeneity, um, but to provide some connective tissue between, between these discussions. Um, and I'm very delighted to, without further ado, introduce you to the first. Um, and I can't think of anyone better to chair it than Rebecca Beinart. So, um, Becky, I'll just uh, read your bio and then wait, welcome you to the stage. Uh, for those of you in Nottingham who don't know uh, Becky, she's an artist, educator, and curator based in Nottingham. She develops research-based, collaborative, and site-based projects that evolve through long-term engagement with places and people. She makes sculpture, installation, and performance, and uses live engagement and public dialogue to reflect on collective histories and futures, social and environmental justice, knowledge-making, and the politics of public space. Rebecca's currently engagement curator at Primary, an artist-led space in Nottingham, running a public program of commissions, workshops, and events, centering co-production and community-led practices. And if uh, people haven't been to Primary or checked out their, their program, I really urge them to do so. There are a lot of um, strands to the work going on there that overlap with the theme of this event. So thank you. Please welcome Becky to the stage. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I'm introducing, and then so we'll be hearing from the two first panellists for today. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Catherine Bohm and Es, es North. Um, I'll just introduce them, read out their bios, and then I think they'll be joining us. Great. So Catherine Bohm is a London-based artist working internationally whose practice focuses on collective reproduction of public space economy as public realm, and the everyday as a starting point for culture. Since the mid-90s, Bohm has expanded the terms of socially engaged practice to an unprecedented scale and breadth of operation, in which she co-produces complex organizational, spatial, visual, and economic forms. Over the last two and a half decades, she has, together with others, developed new infrastructures, including culture as a verb, 2018 to 21, Company, Movements, Deals and Drinks, from 2014 to ongoing. The Haystack Series, since 2013. The Eco-Nomadic School, 2010 to ongoing. And International Village Shop with My Villages, that started in 2007 and is also ongoing. Many of Bohm's works stem from the long-lasting collaborations. She is a founding member of the international artist group My Villages since 2003 the Art and Architecture Collective Public Works from 1999, and the Center for Plausible Economics, sorry, for Plausible Economies since 2018, and a new workers' cooperative, Uno Ino, that started in 2021. And Es North helps to coordinate Cultivating Justice, a collaborative project between Land in Our Names and the Land Workers Alliance LGBTQIA plus organizing group and Farmerama. Ez's background is within NHS healthcare, but he spent the first, past few years doing food growing and other land-based work in the Southwest. So it's my great pleasure to um, welcome both of them and we'll be hearing from them now. Fantastic. Hello. Welcome. Um, so I think we, we've just sort of introduced you both. Um, and I think that Ez was going to start. Is that right? Brilliant. OK. So I'll hand over to you, Ez. Um, then we'll hear from Catherine. And then we'll get into some questions and discussions and open up to contributions from all of you as well. Thanks, Becky. Um, hi, yeah, it's really good to be here with you all today. Um, my name's Ez. Um, I'll just share my screen so that you can see. I've got a few um, slides to share with you all. Um, hopefully this will work. Is that up on the main screen? Great. Yes, that's right, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm joining you from Bristol. Um, I'm one of the, one of several project coordinators with the Cultivating Justice project, um, which I'll introduce shortly. Um, before I do, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to the Landmarkers Alliance, um, who I work alongside on this project. Um, 
So we're a union of farmers, uh, foresters, land-based workers, um, and our sort of mission is to try to create healthier food and land use systems um, and to support our members um, with their livelihoods. Um, so yeah, we have a vision of a future where people can work with dignity to earn a decent living. Everyone can access local, healthy, affordable food, fuel and fibre, uh, and a, a food and land use system that's based uh, on principles of agroecology, food sovereignty, sustainable for forestry, um, furthering social and environmental justice. Um, and so the, the Cultivating Justice Project, it's coordinated between three grassroots organisations. Um, there's Land in Our Names, um, the Land Workers Alliance out on the land organising group, um, who I work with, and Farmerama. Um, and the project intends to build lasting mobilisation and justice for marginalised communities who are resisting colonial, patriarchal and imperialist food and farming systems. So um, there's some direct links here to the organisations um, collaborating in the project. And just to introduce them briefly, um, Land in Our Names, they're a grassroots collective which aims to disrupt oppressive land dynamics relating to BPOP communities in Britain. And they're working towards land justice through a reparative and racial justice framework. Uh, Farmerama are a podcast which platform, uh, pl platforms a diversity of voices from within the regenerative farming movement. And the Landmarkers Alliance um, out on the land group, um, which I coordinate with, um, we self-organise to raise the visibility of LGBTQIA plus land workers, um, challenging heteronormativity within farming, as well as providing links and a sense of solidarity between LGBTQIA plus land workers. Um, and just briefly, uh, introduction to myself. Um, I used to work here in Bristol as a paramedic um, for several years. Um, I, during that work, became uh, very physically unwell and burnt out, unfortunately. Um, and during that time, started volunteering um, within community food growing at a farm just on the edge of Bristol. Um, and yeah, just really fell in love with the work and uh, just seeing like the massively positive impact that um, it can have on local communities and the land and the ecology that we depend on. Um, that really inspired me just to go and um, commit my time um, to that sort of area. Um, yeah. Um, on the sort of background with the project, um, the the need for the project comes out of widespread ongoing systemic injustices um, rooted in colonial exploitation and extractivism within land and food systems, uh, as well as um, patriarchal sort of dynamics relating to these systems. Uh, so yeah, um, got large disparities in agricultural employment. Um, who's able to own land, who's, who has access to green spaces. And three of the groups most affected are black people and people of color, LGBTQIA plus people and women. Um, key land work professions have over 90% white British employees. Normal communities are 60% less likely to be able to access green space, natural environments. Um, women are doing a huge amount of 43% uh, of the global agricultural labor and their work is often really central to developing local food networks and agroecology, um, but they're often receiving low or no salaries, limited training opportunities, and much less likely to be um, in positions of leadership or accessing land as individuals. Uh, and similarly, people from uh, LGBTQIA plus and BPOC communities contribute in many different food and farming settings but are often not receiving the same representation, um, recognition, guaranteed rights as white, uh, straight or cis colleagues. And um, yeah, with, with the project in general, a big part of what we're trying to address is um, this absence of having representation and role models 
um, which makes it very difficult for people to see themselves in a land-based livelihood. Um, so yeah, the phrase, um, you cannot be what you cannot see, um, um, which is a quote by Marion Wright Edelman. Um, that was like a big part of, that, sort of at the forefront of our minds when we were putting the, the project together. Um, we also drew a lot of um, sort of inspiration for the project from a report that our friend Benny Stewart wrote after um, visiting and speaking with several social justice focused farms in, over in the USA. And I just wanted to include a link to that report here because it's really worth checking out um, some really important and interesting learnings in there. Um, yeah, so just to speak a bit more about what we're trying to do with the project. Um, we're aiming to amplify stories of marginalized communities, past and present, engaged in farming, food, nature, and land justice. We wanna create opportunities for joy and celebration and growth within our communities and networks. Uh, challenging conventional stereotypes of who farms and what farming looks like by uplifting stories and creating new narratives. And we wanna create opportunities for us as marginalized people, organizations, and allies to build solidarity and shared visions, organizing direct responses to systemic social injustices within food and farming. And so I guess kind of just by the nature of its aims, the project is working from a post-capitalist position. Um, and a, sort of another big part of the project is, 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 is sort of about assessing and understanding um, how we work together. Um, yeah, and it, it's, feels really essential sort of asking ourselves, what are our values? How are we communicating with each other? What culture can we create within our groups working on the project? Um, and it's, it's still actually really early days with the project. Um, so far, most of our time and energy um, is focusing towards creating a Cultivating Justice podcast series, as well as three zines, um, which explore land justice, food, ecology, farming, um, through decolonial and queer perspectives. Um, and we're hoping to hold some in-person workshops where we'll be able to get together to edit and print and celebrate um, these uh, creations. Uh, so I just thought I'd click through to this link to our zine call out. I hope it will work um, coming up on the screen. Um, just to give you an idea. Um, yeah, this is a call out we've sent recently. Unfortunately, the zine isn't finished yet, so I wish I could bring something um, to share with you. But um, yeah, we've, we've got two further zines underway at the moment. One is on decolonizing and queering botany, which will explore the decolonization and queering of plant science, gardening, market gardening, other land-based activities. Uh, and then there's a second zine which folks are submitting for called Land Workers, um, and that will showcase um, some of land workers that are part of the movement towards more just food and land systems, um, sh sharing their stories, realities, their joy. Um, and that's mostly like a sort of photographic journal sort of zine. Um, so if I pop back to the slides. Um, yeah, and I guess for me, what, like working on this project, it's been really interesting to learn about sort of alternative ways of producing knowledge and sharing knowledge. And um, the zines have been a really like, it's just really interesting to see, uh, yeah, how um, empowering they can be. And yeah, one of many creative tools that can help us to reproduce and exchange knowledge, um, empower each other and disrupt the dominant patterns of education, which um, tend to be based in colonial thought. Um, and yeah, they're, they're just a lot of fun to work on together, to connect over and inspire sort of lasting conversations and hopefully some change and, and movement um, within what we're trying to do. Um, uh, yeah, this is um, just a, a uh, sort of brief share of a page from the first scene that um, my colleague Marcus McDonald from Lion um, coordinated. Um, 
yeah, just wanted to to share a bit of that with you. Um, so, I guess um, also what what struck me a lot when I was thinking about yeah the the kinds of um, outputs that we we're, we're trying to achieve with the project. Um, it's it's been quite like a deliberate choice to focus on these kinds of outputs because they really enable us to maximize our creativity and our connection with each other and also kind of minimizing like uh, firefighting or sort of having the struggle against the systems that are creating the injustices we're trying to address. Um, yeah, so that feels really important sort of Obviously, there's a lot of importance within that that struggle, but but then instead of being able to um, prioritize visioning and dreaming, and and then being able to do our best to realize the kinds of systems and ways of being in the world that we know can transform our well-being and then the planet's well-being, um, that's um, to me like a really inspiring part of this project. Um, and I just wanted to briefly share. Um, some visioning that we did with the out on the land organizing group. Um, so we asked um, uh, several questions and then just allowed ourselves to sort of vision around the project and what, what we wanted to see coming out of it. Um, so I just thought I'd share some of the responses um, that we that came from that. Um, yeah, so I guess kind of in summary, it's just like a really deliberate practice um, of, of trying to sort of undermine and almost like subvert the confines that can be placed on your mind when you're in a situation of having to struggle against oppression. Um, so yeah, so these are quite long to read probably, but just wanted to share them on the screen. Sorry, Ed, just, um, just to check, are we meant to be seeing something other than the aftergrowth sort of slide? Uh, yeah. Um, ah. Should I try and click the link again? Yes, try that again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just taking us back to your kind of first slide for some reason. Uh, okay. Oh, that's a shame. I don't know. I've, um, it might be to do with what, how you're sharing a screen, possibly. Yeah. Um, I'm clicking direct to the link and it's coming up on my screen, but obviously that's not what you're seeing. Um, no, unfortunately not. Sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. I, no worries. Just thought I'd, I'd flag that up. Thank you. No worries. Sorry, I think that must have happened earlier as well. Um, yeah, so this is the visioning that we did as a group. Um, several questions that we asked ourselves and then just allowing us to um, really think about what we want to see coming from the project um, and, and sort of like wider visioning around um, the theme of cultivating justice. Um, so yeah, I'll just let let these show up for a minute. And um, yeah, just um, sort of from doing these sorts of exercises and being involved in this project from my own experience, um, starting to work in this way, um, it's been sort of realizing how much uh, liberation is connected with allowing and encouraging ourselves to imagine and vision and create together, um, whilst also learning to care for each other and show up for each other. Um, so that's been like a really massive part of my own journey as a person from um, LGBTQ community and also as part of kind of healing from burnout um, and I'm just gonna switch back to the PowerPoint um, yes so we don't have all of the answers yet um, on what a post-capitalist world looks like um, but land-based projects and activities and access uh, that are centered around community uh, reparations and social justice have so much um, potential in liberating people from 
extremely oppressive dynamics that continue to be experienced um, within capitalist structures. And I just wanted to finish um, with this slide, which is a working definition of reparations um, from my colleagues at Land In Our Names. Um, um, yeah, um, sorry, it's not a very like a neat conclusion from me, but yeah, I really appreciate you listening and yeah, look forward to carrying on the conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ez. Um, it was really amazing to hear about all of the work that you're doing and um, yeah, the kind of ideas that you've shared. So we will um, hand straight over to Catherine and then um, we'll, after the two presentations, we'll kind of have time for questions and discussion. Right, okay, can you hear me? Yes. A little bit self-aware of how big we are on those screens anyway. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, very humbled to be sitting next to the Land Workers Alliance on the same stage. Um, we are a member of the Alliance. Um, we are big fans of the Alliance and we are very, very happy you exist. Um, I'm here today as a member of Company Drinks, which is a community drinks um, enterprise and many other things embarking in Dagenham, which is um, Zone 6 London. Um, I'm also here as a member of the Community Economies Institute um, and an initiator of the interdependence. And I'm also here as a co-founder of My Villages. And I'm just mentioning this because I'm going to slip in and out of I's and we's and um, apologies for not being able to keep it completely clear um, in this talk. I have 40 slides. Um, so if I'm talking too long, um, kick me out. But I thought... Um, I, I want to introduce a little bit um, company drinks and how um, what we do with economy and post growth. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sharing that first slide, which is a very simple balance sheet um, that we use at some of our events um, to make it clear that everyone who's attending um, is bringing things and taking things. Um, so to immediately um, re organize the roles of those who have um, economic contribution. Um, oh God, I hope this, um, can you see the next slide? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so those sheets are fit in uh, um, very quickly based on um, everyone's interpretation of what they're bringing to the day, what they're taking off the day, and they can include everything from bringing cake to time, to ideas, and taking um, money, positive experience, new ideas, and so on. But just as a very simple tool to instantly say, um, the economy is everything we do every day. And this um, iceberg image is a very kind of central image in this whole argument that, of course, if we look at the economy, the capitalist economy that is very dominant is the one um, that's most visible, um, most influential, but at the same time, there's all other um, economic contributions that enable capitalist economies, um, but should also be recognized as economic contributions, making everyone an economic player. So take back the economy is a bit of a big slogan, but that's what we would like to do. And um, introducing company drinks as um, a very kind of local, um, business in Barking and Dagenham um, that set out in 2014 with um, a relatively simple invitation um, that says let's go picking again. So since 2014 we are picking, um, we're making use of um, what's available, um, what's growing, access to land available to us as an organization and to different members of the communities who should come in. Um, all the different picking trips have, have different economies. Um, this one is an interesting one because it's a gleaning trip to a, a Ribena contractor in Essex. Um, large farms that um, are contracted by a Japanese multinational to grow black currants for Ribena. Um, so we harvest what's left after the uh, commercial harvest. And each harvest that we do um, becomes a drink. And the story of us picking and the documentation of the trip becomes the label. Um, so we've been doing this for a few years. 
Um, we're going picking locally. We're going picking to the nearby countryside, um, which from Dagenham isn't far away. Dagenham actually is in Essex. Um, we go hop picking once a year, which has been a kind of initial narrative for company drinks, um, the history of East End working class families going hop picking um, for working holiday to Kent for about 100 years between 1850 and 1950 in their tens of thousands. So there's also like a whole, uh, there's also a local history of um, going picking, um, matriarchal cultures and um, rural histories. Um, some of the picking is um, involuntary. It's part of curriculums. Um, teachers who um, so we sign up with, we go to, there's an organic farm in Dagenham um, by growing communities. We go strawberry picking there. Um, we also make a cola in the local library um, where Kate Rich from Bristol, you probably know her as um, from the Cube Cinema. Um, they've cracked, uh, re, re, re engineered the um, Pepsi recipe. So we make cola together, we bottle together, we sell drinks. Um, locally and across London. And basically since 2014, um, company drinks um, turns into what we call a drinks family, a range of drinks, which um, is a result of land we have access to, things we can pick, um, ideas for drinks, uh, knowledge around recipes and so on. So this like um, group photo is of course, a product uh, shot, but it's also a representation of what's possible um, within and with the local resources um, in Barking and Dagenham. Um, so for us, business is a means. Um, that's our business plan, roughly. Um, we produce drinks, which are the commodities, and um, have made some quite basic decisions around where the drinks can go. Um, half of the, the drinks stay in the borough and are sold at cost price and um, directly um, go back to everybody who has been involved in <laughs> picking. And half of the produce, uh, half of our drinks we sell at maximum profit in the London art world. Um, as, an, as a company, but also as a public space, we are organized um, circularly and um, along the seasons. Um, so each moment of production from growing to reinvesting is made um, publicly accessible to certain degrees and we follow the season. So we are just leaving the kind of, so summer is the kind of picking, uh, making season, um, autumn is only the trading season and winter is for resting and uh, reinvesting. Um, that's our latest mission text that we've written as a team um, and already I think you can tell that the narrative is shifting from we are just a drinks enterprise um, we are community space and social enterprise where we make drinks with and for each other um, we are also a co-working space and we are as much our own organization as we see ourselves as a network of others collaborators and partners and um, an ecosystem of care. Um, I, I'm going through this quite fast, but most of those things are also on our website, but I thought um, it's important to bring some of those narratives in. Um, Company Drink started as an art commission. I'm an artist. Um, it was commissioned by Create London and received Arts Council money. Um, I don't know if this is of interest today, but maybe since we're in a museum, maybe we want to take about art, talk about art as well. Um, so art can be important. Um, to start things, but it shouldn't uh, remain special um, when it comes to community structures. Um, the principle of art we are using is a principle of usership versus a principle of, of spectatorship, even though sometimes our drinks are in exhibitions. And um, this is a funny and proud moment where company drinks is in a um, landscape exhibition because yeah, at the end, um, this family portrait also describes a contemporary landscape. Um, so the way art is included is within the principles and understanding of cultural democracy. We all produce culture constantly, whether it's economic culture, art, everyday cultures, drinks cultures. 
And company drinks as a logo has the C, which is um, purposefully um, ambivalent in what it could mean. Um, I think for the discussion today, um, of course, the meaning of the comments, um, the meaning of um, collectivized labor and benefiting and the concept of care um, are maybe the three C's we would like to attach to the logo. Um, we have been very nomadic in the beginning, have um, changed a lot during the pandemic because of the pandemic, but also have changed because we wanted to change um, from a kind of pattern of growth and expanding and doing more to a pattern of resting, um, tidying up the organization and sharing our resources uh, with groups who regularly come um, to our side. We have a former sports pavilion in Barking, um, outdoor bowling. Um, we have a small production and training kitchen, um, a nice garden, and that's our site. Um, so I'm quickly going through some slides of like, just to give a sense of what's happening. And it's all really very small scale. Um, to give you a sense of us as a business, um, we are currently four part-time members of the team, and we currently turn over um, income of around 100,000 pounds. We have an equal pay policy of everybody earning 15 pounds an hour. Um, I'm also doing teas by now. Um, and have other public moments outside of the growing and picking where we talk, talk about current food production, um, access to food, the politics around food. So we have a series called Digesting Politics where Dee has been, Dee is a close friend of company drinks, thanks to Cam Jarvis. Um, that's Fosia Ismail from Bristol as well. So we raise um, political issues during com communal dinners. Um, also support other groups to come together and claim access to um, local food um, production, um, the Good Food Collective group that has grown um, out of company drinks, but isn't company drinks. They've launched their own um, product range. And I think also what's really important is that we, we are, of course, just one of many, one of many in the Land Burgers Alliance, but also one of many other groups um, who try to change food change and try to um, establish food sovereignty. Um, last year, we published our organizational values alongside our nutritional values on our drinks and to constantly kind of make clear that, yes, we are making drinks, but we are making drinks to achieve something else. Um, so, as soon as you say your business, you're getting this like, and I think that's a good post growth question like, so how are you going to scale up? How are you not just remaining um, a small localized project? And here I quickly wanted to introduce the idea of the interdependence, ACA IDT. And the interdependence is a multi local contagion between community economy initiatives. Um, which wants to surface the ubiquity and in interconnectedness of community economy activities. And that's a term I use um, a lot to describe company drinks, the idea of a community economy model. Um, organizations um, affiliated to the independence can add the abbreviation to their name with the idea that we slowly replace limited by IDT. Um, so that's a label um, that came about two years ago, um, still is smaller than we would want to, but we're working on it. Um, and it's a label that we put in addition on our drinks, um, mainly to signal that we are connected to others, um, that we are part of a much larger um, ecosystem of organizations, initiatives, businesses, grassroots organizations who practice a different economy, um, and on a drinks range, we have um, two colleagues, um, Cube Cola from Bristol, um, the in initial um, cola concentrate that we're using, and uh, Comunita Frizzante in Northern Italy, who are organized around the same um, ideas like company drinks. 
So I think this IDT, I just wanted to add it in the end for us is an important reminder that um, we are in this together with many others, um, but we also act um, on a kind of translocal, um, translocal level, which is important for us to be able to work outside of a kind of international level where we have to keep using the national as an identifier. So the translocal for us is the better term. Um, both company drinks and the IDT are made by many. And I want to say thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, a round of applause for both of you for sharing some amazing and really inspiring ideas and projects. Um, so I get the privilege of asking the first question and um, and then, or maybe a couple, to kind of get the conversation started, but also um, really inviting both of you, Ez and Catherine, to respond to each other and what each other have just shared. Um, and then we'll take questions and contributions from all of you as well. Um, so, in fact, the first thing I wanted to ask, just as a point of clarification, Catherine, about company drinks was... Um, when you would, uh, you showed us at the start the kind of in and out, the transaction people have um, through their involvement. Is there any paid labor in that, in, in the company drinks model? Okay, I just wasn't clear yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, no, there is different roles and um, we're trying to be clear about them. So there's a team um, of four at the moment who is organizing and maintaining our space and making it um, accessible. Um, so that team is eat, everyone's paid. We are all part-timers paid um, 15 pounds an hour. And then whenever someone is being paid, there's this like equal pay range. Um, but others also join as volunteers, want to stay volunteers. So those roles can change, but they are being explicit and negotiated and interchangeable. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Um, there's so many things that you shared, both of you. Um, and I thought that maybe a good place to start or kind of a question that I had in my head was kind of digging a little bit more into this question of access to land, because I feel like that's, you know, underlying so much of what we're talking about um, in the session. Um, and I wondered if you could both talk a bit, bit more about maybe strategies that you use. So I think it's really interesting to hear about the way that company drinks, you know, moves around between commercial farms and I think I've seen from um, the website kind of like urban foraging and you know land that might not be directly owned or by yourselves but but places that you can get access to um, and as obviously I know that Land Workers Alliance is kind of working with many different types of land workers from kind of urban to rural but it it was would be really interesting to hear a bit more from you about um, you know, you brought it up at the end, this point about reparations and kind of, yeah, just a bit, a bit more about that and if there are ways in which, like, ownership and access are getting transferred or, you know, the beginnings of that. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble. Um, I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Um, I'm happy to... Yeah, I can... I can thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, so... Um, I think it's... It feels like in, in from the UK perspective, it's definitely like it feels a, like a very the 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 definitely the the concept of reparations is coming into conversations um, more now than when I first started um, becoming involved with um, small scale farming, and um, it's it's definitely agroecology in general. Um, social justice focused conversations are definitely coming up more often but um it's definitely still something that um needs to be um supported to come to the forefront much more um and you know um yeah to, to really like center the, the voices of those who are most affected um by issues of access to land and um to support people into positions of leadership um, is super important and um, yeah I think can be happening much more needs to be happening much more um, um, 
And I think there's, there's models that we can look to, um, like the, tran the, tran the, the transfer of um, land and resources um, to um, BPOC communities. Um, there's some models in, that I know of uh, from a project in the United States called um, Soul Fire Farm, um, who have uh, created a reparations map, um, um, which allows um, direct transfer of land and resources. Um, so that, that sort of project, you know, um, um, really like direct action on this issue is, is something we really need to see. And yes, yeah, so I guess sort of um, looking to projects like that, um, really important as well. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have like a, a fuller answer for you. Um, yeah, it's definitely still something that I'm um, myself like learning about as well. And um, yeah. Um, um. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not expecting anyone to have a full answer. It's, um, but it's a really, I, I think it's really interesting the way La Land Workers Alliance is working. And also I'll, maybe we'll, uh, once Catherine's responded to this, we can also come on to more of the um, um, spaces for imagination that you were talking about really powerfully. Um, yeah, because it's such a, a deeply embedded, um, you know, and historical injustice, the way that land ownership works. So, um, sorry, I'll pass over to you, Catherine. We are within a kind of urban context. So there's the first, um, almost the first barriers to think about an urban landscape as maybe a growing landscape, a landscape to, to think about where do we have access to. I mean, the, the urban landscape is organized through like public space and private space. Um, but many of many of the land within is like a borough like Barking Dagenham is just seen as parks and recreations, you know, they're not read as landscapes that actually still produce food or um, a discussion around who has access to what's growing. So I think that's that's one of the issues we are trying to raise. And then of course, um, who's holding those narratives around holding knowledge when it comes to picking and making and growing. And um, I mean, I think on that level, we, what we are trying to do is to make that an open space that this narrative around who's holding knowledge about growing and picking and drinks making is held by many and um, the demographics in Barkingham is one of many. So it is, it, it is an organizational um, issue of, of access and, um, and, and, um, and inclusion very directly, um, yeah. But I think the first, really not to forget, we are talking about an urban setting is those parks are not read as places where you could pick or could forage to make food. So there's two, there's two issues around access. One to access those spaces as food producing spaces again, but also to access those spaces together um, with diverse narratives. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering whether anyone has a, a kind of a question or contribution ready to go already. I'm just looking over there. Okay, so there's somebody just here with a hand up. We've got a mic just coming. So if you just hold on for the microphone, that'd be brilliant. I don't know if this is working either. Yes. Um, I'm yes. Helen Skinner and I would normally be on my allotment today. Now, I'm very interested in land ownership because um, we used to have free access to land until it was robbed from people when the enclosure movement happened very, you know, very simply. And then in order to reduce the tax burden on the rich of people dying all over the place and having to go in workhouses, they decided to um, allow people bits of land and, and that's how the allotments came really. So the allotments were given to people, the right to have an allotment was given to people to stop them dying of hunger everywhere and causing a nuisance. So we still have this right to allotments I mean, it can, you know, if they're devious enough, they can prevent us having it. But we should all be demanding this right to the land that we're still entitled to. And allotments are wonderful places. We've got 10 nations represented on our allotment in the middle of a council estate. So I think we should be demanding more access to those. 
Um, there's also a movement called Incredible Edible all over the place where people grow vegetables on unwanted patches of land. And, you know, that's ha happening all over the place as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, so there's another person. If we take that hand as well, and then um, perhaps you could both respond if you'd like to. Well, on, on a similar theme, am I audible? Um, yeah. Yes, can you both hear? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't grow anything to save my life other than weeds, which I can grow really well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I've had some interest in the co-op movement. And uh, one of the things about capitalism, if you threaten it, if you, if you are perceived as a threat, then you can expect a lot of uh, challenge and eventually co-option. So, uh, but the inspiring thing is where it came from. So in 1844, a group of people in Rochdale established a group co uh, called the Rochdale Society for Equitable Pioneers. So they were gonna build a new economy, a new world on the basis of equity. And I only just discovered what equity is about, but I like it really a lot. So that organization now has over 4 million members and is a 10, plus billion pound of, uh, economy, but it's been almost totally co-opted by capitalist forces, sadly. So how do we stop this massive power that uh, we don't like very much? <laughs> and how do we allow projects like yours to grow into something that can provide, for the majority of people, a, a, a livable world, a post-growth world? Okay, um, Agatha, do you want to respond to this point? I mean, I, I first like to respond to the cooperative um, observation. Um, just to say, the UK is the only country where the cooperative is not protected as a label. Um, in every other country, you actually have to be a cooperative to call yourself one. Um, I think that's just an important uh, detail to know. Um, company drinks is organized in a cooperative manner. You know, you can organize any, like almost anything in cooperative manner without having to be a cooperative. And those are more princip principles around equity, um, not wanting managerial structures, organizing around competence and responsibilities and interests rather than hierarchies. Um, so it's both um, a protected label, not in the UK, but also a way of organizing, which we can all do. Um, the, I think with the interdependence, which is a bigger discussion, um, and if you keep the iceberg in mind, um, we are all complicit you know, in, in, in capitalism to a certain degree. Um, it would be um, unreal for company drinks to say that we do not rely on capitalist structures to exist and sustain. Um, but I think this slogan of taking back the economy is to insisting on other um, values and other possible practices and slowly erasing um, capitalist pain and oppressive structures through our own practice. Um, and that is currently on a small scale. But I think that's why like the, the, the Land Workers Alliance and also the idea of like the interdependence are important to say, look, the critical mass of practices and ideas is actually much bigger than we can see and to not organize as multinationals, but to organize through new coalitions and um, networks and expressions of being in this together. Uh, it was a bit of a waffle in the end. I apologize as I hand over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, I guess just briefly to respond to the first uh, question about um, urban access to land and allotments. Um, yeah, definitely like really agree about the power of allotments and um, how important that that um, sort of access is and definitely I know where I live there there's waiting lists that are like years long to be able to get onto an allotment and I think yeah that's something that really needs to be prioritized um like putting healthy food um into the heart of neighborhoods and making that a priority um 
yeah, the, like the, there's allotments there, but we definitely need more of that and, and really enabling people to um, have that access and that agency to grow their own food. It's so, so important. Um, and uh, like with cooperatives, I, um, it's uh, not an area that I have a lot of knowledge around, um, but I know that the Landmarkers Alliance are um, doing a lot of thinking around how to support farmers in um, in setting up cooperatives in, in, and in sort of actually just like having the, equipping ourselves with the knowledge and um, skills to um, run with that kind of setup. Because um, it's definitely something that can, can be so like uh, beneficial um, to land workers and um, to the kind of creative ways in which we can um, develop land-based projects, but is also like a, a complex thing to set up and or can be a really complex thing to set up and run. So yeah, I think that's something that I'd love to see um, or I'm excited to see sort of happening is like more support for um, farmers and fruit growers to know how to do cooperative working and um, to, to, yeah, to support each other in that process of um, setting up co-ops. Thanks. Um, yeah, we've got another question over here. If we could just wait for the mic. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you to both speakers. I really enjoyed hearing about the projects. Um, and Katrina, you, you mentioned the working with schools and the curriculum with company drinks. I, I'm just interested for both speakers in both of the projects, Cultivating Justice and Company Drinks, um, how they've worked with different levels of education, so primary, secondary and tertiary, how you've included those, those students and kind of what some of the strategies and the results have been. We, we, we have been doing it um, because we are so barking and dagging and based, like if any school wants to join one of the programs, we do that. So we either do it as individual trips um, where we literally take um, year groups just out to the next park to pick elderflower. Um, we do birch sapping, we're going to farms. And the idea of picking a fruit and putting it in your mouth is exciting. Um, we've also worked with um, a college level, but what, 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 the, um, what the focus is at the moment, um, the, the three London markets, um, Billingate, Spitalfields and Smithfields are moving to Barking. Um, I mean, this is major. Yeah. Um, that's the city of London uh, buying land in Barking to move the three wholesale markets to Barking. And as part of this, we're involved in discussion around what training is needed and who needs training for what. Um, so the city of London mainly needs um, forklift drivers. You know, this is very much within a kind of capitalist thinking of like, what training do we need and what labor do we need? Basically, what labor do we need rather than um, what training do we want? Um, so we are very much kind of trying to lobby the council, but also the um, city of London to look at grassroots level, what knowledge exists and what would be needed to lift that existing knowledge to a level where it can become cooperative food enterprises, sustainable businesses and so on. Um, but that for someone like the city of London is a, is, is a different approach to how they would normally think training. They normally think training of like where the skill gaps and we need, I don't know, like forklift drivers, whereas we are saying, please look at what's the existing knowledge that's maybe not formalized yet or not professionalized yet, um, but what forms of training um, could actually support and grow a local food culture rather than just think training in terms of cheap labor. So that's where we are at the moment. Do you want to add anything as from a Land Workers Alliance perspective? Um, with the question be able to um, be repeated just once more, sorry. Sure, uh, well, I'll try and ask, I mean, I forget this right. Um, it was to do with the kind of your, um, interaction with education and I think the question was sort of all, all levels of education and all ages so I mean I guess um, maybe um, you could particularly talk about that in relation to cultivating justice but or, or, or more widely with Land Workers Alliance. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, I, um, so the Lamarck Alliance has, um, what's coming to mind straight away is um, an organising group called Flame, which are a youth kind of uh, wing of or organising group with the, the LWA. Um, and some of the Flame members are involved in um, creative elements of the Cultivating Justice Project. Um, and um, yeah, it's been really inspiring to see that group start because when I first joined the union, there was no um, kind of uh, sort of space for um, youth organising. There was sort of like informal support, but there was no like um, designated space for that. So really, really great to see that happening. And um, there's so much like momentum within that group and so much um, energy being put into um, youth organising and training opportunities um, and upskilling and skill sharing. Um, so yeah, I guess just wanting to highlight like the importance of that and um, how much um, of a, a positive impact it can have on on like the, the strands of work that the LWA is developing um, and you know definitely within the Cultivating Justice Project also really important to us that it's um, you know like a um, kind of multi-generational project um, and that we're working together across um, um, age groups. Thanks Ez. Um, we've got a couple more questions so we'll pick one at the front here. Um, thank you both so much um, for your presentation. Some of some of that I was aware of, some of that I wasn't, which is super exciting. And especially, I think, being in the UK, it's always really wonderful to know there's all these people that you don't know about, even when it's your field. <laughs> um, so I have a question about kind of how you in your organisations are working with ideas of whiteness, solidarity and imperialism. Because I know that's something that happens when we're often kind of taking models from the US is we try to replicate those racial and historical relationships as well, such as the Reparations Act, right, which is a very particular relationship between racialized people and land and economy in the US. And we have different historical relationships between land, economy, and racialized people, and colonialism and imperialism. So it'd be really great to hear how you're working with, yeah, with whiteness, with solidarity, particularly in the UK context, around the idea of local, idea of foraging, idea of access, and within your own organisations. If you could share anything, that would be really wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, if one of you let's go first. Thank you. Um, yes, so um, thank you for the question. A really important question. Um, and I think Within my experience so far of organising um, within the Landmark Alliance out on the land group, um, it's very much an ongoing process of um, uh, self-education within the group um, and really like um, making sure that we're taking time to understand um, where we're at um, with positions of power and privilege, um, um, with um, white privilege and how that um, can play out um, in terms of um, I guess yeah making sure that we we understand ourselves from that view that um, perspective so that we can then um, figure out um, what we need to do for ongoing kind of anti-oppression um, self-education and then also how we can um, figure out ways of working within our group and with other groups um, that um, you know take that into account and um, in um, enabling like empowering ourselves and each other to be able to create uh, safe spaces and um, yeah to be able to continue these conversations. Um, with each other and others in a, in a way that oh, it's, I'm not sorry, not very clear. Um, it's it's basically something that we're we're trying to be really intentional about, um, and we we're in the process of kind of like trying to um, basically define a strategy. That the group's very young, like has only really started in the last year, um, so trying to define a strategy of how we self educate um, and then how we put into place. Um, 
um, intentional practices to do with power and privilege and, and how we communicate. Um, and I think um, from my perspective, I don't feel like I can have enough yet, enough knowledge um, to talk about um, the, the strategy for reparations in the UK context. Um, that's something I need to definitely do more reading and um, um, education of myself for myself on um, so that I can speak speak about it um, yeah in this context so I'm really sorry I don't have more to kind of feedback with that um, yeah I'll have another I'll have more of a think um, I'll let Catherine respond as well. Um, uh, for company drinks um, um, we ha have to recognize um, institutional racism um, we had to recognize and have to recognize that we are mainly white team. Um, that's a moment of organizational change, which I was almost shying away of not talking about company drinks today, because I think those are processes that, I, that are ideally finished before you make claims again. Um, but we are actively in the process of um, becoming an explicit anti-racist organization that has started with Black Lives Matter, um, which was of course too late, but it still was the moment for us to become explicit. Um, we, are big, we are explicitly an anti-racist organization in Barking and Dagenham, um, but have decided that we first need to reorganize all internal processes. Um, to be certain that we can say the spaces we offer are as safe as possible. Um, we are currently still in the process um, of feeling confident that we can say that. Um, so that's where we are. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think for any organization that is white led and we are a very small one um, to actually try and embed the changes that are needed is a slow process, um, a process of self-reflection and then change of policy structures and everything. Um, and all I can say, and I think that's why I'm so a little bit self-aware that I'm so big on the screen, is that I think we are trying to put this into practice and hopefully within the next half year, Company Drinks become, becomes that safe space where we then confidently can ask to share all the decision-making processes um, with others who want to come into this decision-making team. But just to say it is a slow process, we are on the way, I wouldn't want to claim anything we aren't, um, but to explicitly become an anti-racist organization has been of significance in, in parking. And all the issues that come around land ownership and so on, I think once we've shared uh, the, 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 the decision-making team in the company then will be readdressed differently. Thanks for the question. We've got um, a few, quite a few hands up as well, so we could please start off um, there. Yeah, thank you both very much. Um, super inspiring stuff. Um, I suppose my question may be a little bit more mundane, I hope not. Um, but I kind of wonder, um, what kind of relationship you have with the local authorities um, sort of in and around where you work, um, both as organisations and, and individuals, and have you formed any alliances with them to kind of help shape land policy or kind of uses of land, or do you find it's unhelpful to kind of work with them and work in a, in a, in a way that's kind of outside of that, um, that mechanism? That's it. We could just take the, the next question as well. I'm aware we're going to run out of time, so if we just hear them and then we can get started. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, thanks so much both for the presentations. I've just got a question really for um, Catherine, um, which was something that kind of came up in your talk, and I think it's really interesting, which was the distinction between, like, which you drew between uh, usership and spectatorship um, in the presentation. And I kind of I want to sort of ask a question about the kind of objectives 
behind the focus on usership, urban spectatorship, um, and the kind of politics behind that, I suppose, uh, as a strategy of resistance. Okay, um, so we'll just, I can see someone's got a hand up at the back. We'll just take those two questions and then we might have time for that one more. Um, so, sorry, did you both kind of get the questions? The first one about relationship with um, councils, and then the second one. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll be able to paraphrase you. So, I'll let you respond. Do you want to respond um, to that one first, Catherine? Is it a direct question? Um. We have a good relationship with the councils, are a complicated piece, but um, if you have a leader who says he is feminist, then, you know, we obviously support, support that. So we support um, council messages, which often align with ours. Um, as I said, we are tiny, um, but I think over the years, we, we have built a relationship where now Hopefully, with those three markets coming to Barking, I, I, we know that we are valued um, as an organization um, that has local knowledge that could really be of interest in shaping uh, those new training policies and um, food culture policies for the, for the borough. So I'm never too certain um, where things will go. But um, over the years, we've built quite a, a slow, steady relationship where we are hammering home the knowledge that, or the fact that there is knowledge, there is food culture. It might not look like the one in Hackney or, you know, Paris or whatever, um, but um, that the council has to pay more attention and put more resources to existing knowledge and cultures in order to make one that's particular and also needed to the council instead of importing models from elsewhere. So I think over the years we've, we've gained a voice and I hope um, this will lead to something very soon. Um, Ed, did you want to respond to, to either of those questions? Um, so with the Cultivating Justice Project, um, we, we at the moment don't have, um, it hasn't uh, played out in kind of having physical growing space at this point and um, that's definitely something that could happen in the future um, so we haven't had access um, interactions with local councils in terms of like what the project's doing yet because um, it's mainly been online based um, work and uh, you know there'll be events and gatherings and so on but it's yeah very early days like I was saying so yeah that's not um, not really been a factor of the project yet. Um, is it possible to get a, a sort of paraphrase of the second question sorry? Um, would it be possible to repeat it? I'm sorry as well, I didn't quite um, catch it. Um, yes, it's, oh, hello, hi. Yes, it's just really, it's really for Catherine. It was a question about the distinction in your talk um, about usership and spectatorship and the extent to which like, focusing on usership over spectatorship might be a form of resistance or strategy of resistance. And I was kind of interested in just like, um, when, I was just wondering if you could unpack that kind of distinction a bit more. Any like like with company drinks, I'm at the moment the only artist on the team, so it's only that that much attention um, to like art. Um, but I think I have to think of myself as an artist being in those processes. And for me, the thinking around the usership of art, and which is very different to like the usefulness of art, is one that allows me to work with curiosity and a certain ease in those situations. Um, so it's less about me as an artist saying I want this for the purpose of that or I want people to use things. It's less about determining um, what the outcome is um, but saying whatever my contribution is um, to something like company drinks, the way it that can, that then gets used is where I see um, the use value of art rather than me predetermining what the use value is going to be. But this um, usership model, of course, is a di direct critique of um, a current um, status of art that comes from this bourgeois um, and capitalist idea of art being remote from society and mainly existing within institutions and the market. So it's a direct criticism of 
a current understanding of uh, contemporary art practice as a kind of autonomous um, practice remote from society and mainly executed through the art market. So yes, it is a critique. Lucy wants to take one more question. Okay, so at the back, if we can have a brief question and a brief response, that'd be great. Hello, thanks. Um, I think the lady um, sort of preempted my original question, so I changed it. Um, I think, yeah, um, thinking of uh, race as a technology of capitalism, um, I think it is important, as was implied by the front, that it is deployed in different ways, in different contexts, so we do have to understand that the UK is a different context to America. Um, with regards to that, um, with regards to the question of reparations, I, I almost think there's a danger that um, a sort of a liberal anti-racism can appropriate re reparations in, within a capitalist framework. So I'm wondering about this idea of reparations and to what extent do we need to go beyond um, capitalist frameworks of this, when it comes thinking of land as a sort of a private zone of capital and towards, um, towards thinking about reparations as an idea to change our idea of land as value and towards what I would advocate for, which is, um, which is a commons, global commons. Thank you. Yeah, again, like super interest, um, important question to, to think around. Um, and yeah, I'm really sorry. I, I wish I had more experience in this kind of area of speaking. So I'm sorry if um, my contributions are like don't go in depth enough. Um, I think, like just from my experience um, so far, of um, the way in which uh, land is distributed in the UK, and um, you know, I guess. Yeah, there's there's a private private ownership model that's um, rooted in colonialism and white supremacy, and um, that it doesn't um, it's ah oh, sorry I'm <laughs> um, I don't know what what words I'm trying to find um, I think yeah this perspective of land as commons is is really important and and kind of understanding it from the perspective that everyone should be able to access land should be able to grow their own food um you know as a basic right to healthy food and um there as far as i know there's 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 not at the moment like um systems um in the uk that are um sort of fit for like the redistribution of land and that of um that are working out how to um um uh, like initiate reparations processes of reparation and um obviously that's something that is um you know needs to be happening and 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 isn't as far as i can as far as i know um and um yeah i think there's definitely a big part of it that needs to um, sort of assess how how we relate to each other as people, and then how we relate to the land as people. And um, that relationship definitely is like primarily primarily been really broken for a really long time. So um, I guess it's kind of about first understanding that, and then um, looking at how we can um, kind of a create um, make space spaces for healing. Um, that relationship and B um, make spaces for thinking about how we then move forwards um, with uh, like a, like healthier models for um, or like a processes that really um, you know directly um, address reparations and and then and also um, yeah throughout that process like um, creating these healthier ways of being with each other and with the land. Um, but I'm sorry, that's, that's so like too vague and um, it's definitely an area I need, I want to and need to go away and um, look at more. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a great answer for, for everyone. Yes, I think it was a very good answer and I think that was a big question. So <laughs> I think it's not a good <laughs> um, I could just quickly maybe say something around language. Um, 
And I think when I said like the C in company can be interpreted in different ways, um, we need a certain flexibility around language. Um, the comments is of course something I fully support as a practice. It's not necessarily a practical term um, when you talk about want to talk about economy in a in a community setting. Um, so we tend to be a little bit flexible with our, our language. So whether it's community economies or solidarity economies, um, a lot of people would undersign that they want economies that are non-exploitative, non-oppressive. They'd rather have economies that are nurturing and enabling. Um, but I think it's difficult to um, insist on one term. So I think I'd rather, until we... I'd rather use a kind of range of terms um, to work in this kind of anti-capitalist manner without always having to call it like that. Uh, but I think this um, taking back the economy as something that we are all active actors in through the actions every day um, for us at Company Drinks or for me at Company Drinks is quite an important step because of course, there are those brutal economies that are trying to destroy us, but I think there's also huge pride and joy in experiencing that you can practice and organize economies around other principles and ethics. And I think that's what's so important, what the Landwork Alliance does. You know, it does also say we can do this. This is not an ideology, you know, this is a practical way of organizing. Um, and that's why. For us, the organization is hugely, hugely important to, again, not just be a small community project somewhere in Barking, but say we are part of a much bigger movement of actually knowing how, how things can be reorganized um, in order to work for communities and the planet. Oh, okay. It's Sunday afternoon. That was a very Sunday-ish last word. Okay. Um, thank you both very much I'm aware of time I think we're going to have to wrap up now I feel like so much has kind of come up through this conversation and um, many really important questions which I feel like um, there are going to be people in the room who, who have additional things to add to that that maybe that conversation will get picked up in, in the other plans today and in some of the things that were discussed yesterday just a quick I guess it's a question for everyone and a question for the organisers that um, I know there are people who are doing really fantastic work on this kind of UK historical context and that what justice you know, comes out from that specifically. Um, and I'm guessing there's going to be ways of sharing resources afterwards. Okay, so I think there's, you know, in terms of um, us all self-educating more and having those reference points with people who will be speaking about it today and there'll be ways of sharing more resources, which I think is really important. So thank you both so much for your contributions. It's been amazing to learn more about the uh, movements and organisations uh, that you're both involved with and thanks everybody for your really great questions and comments. Well,